Boys, yes. look who's back on the crew reviews. All four of us. <laughs> <laughs> and here we are with Greg Hurwitz. How are you, sir? I'm doing good. It's good to see uh, you all. It's good to be back with everybody here. Well, it's been a minute since we talked to you. Um, I hear there's a new book coming out. Uh, I heard the title was The Last Orphan. And uh, we've been a little hiatus, and we definitely wanted to talk about Evan Smoke and what he's up to this time around. So, Greg, let's give our audience a little overview of what's in store for Evan this time. Well, for a long time, we've been seeing Evan going on all these missions. He went off the radar from the government. He's been kind of on the run. They've been going after him. He's been doing a lot of these pro bono assassination missions, helping people who've got nowhere to turn. And I always had in the back of my head, at some point in this series, they're going to catch up to him and they're going to get him. Mm. Government's going to come back. They're going to capture him. What's that going to be like now that he's been in the world and he's sort of built his own space? Of, you can't quite call it a community with Orphan X, but he's yeah. got his people. He's got Tommy. He's got Joey. He's got Mia. Yeah. And this is the book where they catch up to him finally. It's a massive manhunt. Um, it's a huge and elaborate elaborately choreographed takedown and he basically winds up you know hannibal lectured in a room <laughs> bound every which way and uh, has a straight line into the president of the united states who says we got a mission we have somebody who we can't kill in a sanctioned way who's unbelievably dangerous and we need executed you either complete one last mission yeah. or we'll kill you and so Evan has to make a choice whether he's going to uphold his ethics or if he's going to save his life. Mm -hmm. um, and how can he navigate that solution if they're going to turn him loose to complete this mission when it goes against the grain of everything that he thought? And yet the mission also might be one that is worthwhile morally, and he's got to figure out whether that's the case or not. Yeah. Um, and the other thing that I'll add to this on a personal front, I always think about having the stakes escalate for Evan externally right and this is a pretty big escalation right. they also have to escalate for him internally um, and this is one of the times when he's captured and brought and controlled his body's controlled his movements are controlled he's back where he was but worse it cracks open all sorts of trauma in him that goes right. all the way back to you know early childhood and we're going to see parts of that in ways that he has to contend with that as an operator that right. those aren't really cards that I've turned over yet in the series. Yeah. And we see a lot of conversations in his head from his days when he was first, first starting out as a, as a kid. So um, you kind of partially answered my, my next question then um, in, for me, books are kind of like children in a family. The, the origin or the originators are the same, but each has its own kind of personality. And oftentimes that kind of come out, comes out unpredictable. Um, so how was The Last Orphan different than the others in the execution or the intent of what you were trying to do versus all the others? Well, one of them is this piece about him contending you know one of, i've said before and we've talked about this in past interviews that the line for me around which the orphan x series coalesces is jack telling evan the hard part isn't making you a killer the hard part is keeping you human mm -hmm. so now he's made some headway in that front he has you know i always say he he never learned the strange language of intimacy but he's paid attention he's been put in the world he's reclaimed a little piece of his soul here and there with these different missions and so when the trauma comes through at this point, he feels differently than he would have before. Mm. He's open, right? It's vulnerability. He's got vulnerability in his relationship with Joey. He's got vulnerability with how he moves through the world now and how he even literally experiences and feels things differently. So that's a very new situation. And I think that the kind of demons that he's grappling with now, he wouldn't have even had access to two books ago. So that's number one. And number two is um, who he's up against, Luke Devine, mm. right? He's yeah. up against a protagonist who isn't bigger, tougher, gangster, cartel, killer, power figure. Well, he's a power figure. He's the ultimate power player, but he's really a master manipulator. He's got, he's, he's unbelievably um, powerful in his intellect, in his reach, in his ability to pull levers of power to get everybody singing and dancing a particular tune. 
and to get inside people's heads and try and turn them inside out. And so it's a very different landscape on which the battle happens between him and Evan, because it's one that it's very psychological in the engagement and Evan's circling him, trying to figure out if he is a target who he's been aimed at, who he is justified in killing, or if he's merely somebody who is a human who he disagrees with on tons of different fundamentals, but is sort of like the cerebral counterpart, the intellectual counterpart to Evan. Like if Evan's a fixer on a street level right. for people, if Evan figures out what is the path that he wants to move outside the law, breaking rules, breaking regulations, asking for no permission, right? Asking for nothing. Right. This guy's doing it in a whole different lane where he's got senators in his pocket. He's pulling levers on bills, trade, spy craft, all sorts of things. And he's a power player who's so immense that the government is, is it straining to figure out how they can contain him. Mm -hmm. um, it's very interesting. I obviously wrote this right. well before, but you see a little bit of the dynamic playing out in, in recent months with like Elon Musk, <laughs> right? Who feels, right? Exactly. Who feels more powerful than the whole government in certain ways. Like people don't even know what to do or how to contend with him. Right. Luke Devine is a quieter version of that because mm -hmm. he's somewhat backstage pulling all the puppet strings, but he's a very, very dangerous character for Evan psychologically. Hmm. Which probably the back backstage thing probably makes him more dangerous actually. Than, right. Than the guy in front of everybody. Well, kind of sticking with the existential themes we're talking about, but going into, you know, we're all book geeks here. So going into a creative aspect of it, the Orphan X series is is a complex mix of the personal and the spectacular. Um, the plots have stakes that vary from wide impact, like this book has a lot of that, but it also those that only affect a handful of people. Um, but within e both within each book and the series at large, um, do you consciously weigh that balance of spectacle versus relational, or does the muse just kind of direct you as to what type of story you're telling? Well, I think it's both. Um... You know, it's funny, I don't, all the muse conversations, I'm always, at, at, I don't love discussing things that way at, for fear that I, I will come off as being precious, but we all know when we're writing, there are sometimes when plots and stories and scenarios start to fall out of our brains. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And you don't really know where they come from, but you know when they're right. You mm -hmm. know, you're, it's like, oh, right, that's the dynamic of that scene, right? That's where it is. Yeah. And part of this too is it's just built into the template. Like I'm not necessarily interested in just writing a big kind of weapons porn actioner, right. right? Where we kind of move through. I mean, we've all had that feeling of like action fatigue in the third act of the latest, you know, pre-branded movie. Yeah. Everything's got to come down to the personal. And so with this case, there's all these huge stakes, right? There's the president of the United States. There's this power player. There's a giant bill that he's, manipulating that's going through Congress. There's a bribery scheme and blackmail scheme that puts, you know, Jeffrey Epstein to shame. There's all this stuff. But for Evan, his point of entry to the story is one boy who was killed, one young man who was killed, one young woman who was killed. That's what everything's about. He grounds everything in the concrete and the personal. And it's a conversation that he has quite overtly with Luke Devine, who keeps talking about these grand theories and how fast he moves. Luke Devine's hypomanic. So he his brain works at like warp speed, right? And he's always talking and compounding and building these structures and scaffolding with his theories. And Evan's like, one young man, one young girl, they were murdered. It's all that matters. When you think up there too much, when you move too fast, you miss things, right? And you can convince yourself of your own moral righteousness through verbal play in a lot of ways it's milton's lucifer and paradise lost right milton's lucifer oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. is the intellect that falls in love with itself and believes it can convince itself of anything and so there's a grounding that evan has to have when confronting the spectacular or the abstract or the grand which is it's always got to be about an individual yeah so uh following that thread a little bit many of your novels uh, feature characters dealing with psychological trauma, absent parents, orphan children, sexual abuse, murder. I mean, you write thriller, so any bad thing that can happen in life is fair game. But how do you approach writing about such sensitive topics and ensure authenticity in your characters? Hmm. That's a really interesting question. You know, part of it is, is not writing 
around trauma or abuse, let's say, or horrific uh, circumstances, not writing around them in a way that's, that's, that's reverential, mm. meaning in our own lives, when we have a problem, when I have a friend going through something awful, when we're contending with something, there's got to be humor. There's got to be slop to it. There's got to be a mess. There's got to be pieces yeah. that make no sense. There's got to be conflicting feelings. It's It can't be where it's clean that we have trauma and we're going to elevate it and polish it like a jewel and place it on a satin pillow. Yeah. And we can all sort of look reverentially at how you know, wonderfully I'm engaging with and depicting trauma in a way that's real and respectful. To me, it's all the grit. It's all the dirtiness around it. And the way that we self-deceive um, the way that we have biases, the way that our defense mechanisms sometimes roar up and make us act in ways that are are ways that we are ashamed of, right? Or ways that we might regret and the ways that we joke about stuff and the ways that we put it off and we banter and we spar, the ways we make things okay around it. And that's really important to me. If I'm writing something that feels like it's um, a scene that's really between two people, and they're coming at it in a way that has real life sorts of dialogue, then I'm in good shape. If I'm writing sort of at some theoretical remove that I'm now going to discuss trauma and here's a bunch of theory around trauma and here's how people react logically and emotionally, that's usually garbage and I got to throw it out. Do you, do you do that though, Greg? Do you write that stuff in like your first draft or, or, or something like that and then go back and like, nope, crap, and then streamline it? You know, I've been at it a while now enough that usually it's not a whole scene anymore, but I'll have lines in there that I thought of, right. That, that were lived somewhere in my file of scraps that I put in and I go back <laughs> and, read and go, that's way too on the nose. You know, this happens a lot, like where you'll write a scene and maybe the point of the scene is let's say it's a romantic scene or, or even a familial scene. And the point of the scene is I love you, right? Right. And you can write a whole scene and have the character say that in the middle. And what you want to do is take that line and pull it out and have mm. the whole scene say that without anyone saying it, right? right? And so that'll happen sometimes where I'll read back and be like, oh, thanks, that's my cliff note line. I don't need that, right? Um... I'm trying to cut it or push things further into subtext or push things further into um, imagery that says the same. Because I always want to connote i always want the reader to be doing the math yeah him yeah. or herself right I I say, trust the reader right trust the reader yeah. to, to get yeah it. that's right uh i want to shift specifically back to last orphan um for a second um evan's in the back of a vehicle it's early in the book mm -hmm. and i'm not going to spoil it for anybody kind of hinted at some of that uh, but in a conversation he has with some individuals in this vehicle the detailed account of a mission that that could go off at any second is very specific and highly detailed and leaves you to believe that, yes, it would be very successful against all odds and against all the beliefs that these people have that are sitting around him. Uh, did you receive any help in that whatsoever? Or did you, <laughs> did you stand in the shower and just maniacally laugh as you figured out the pieces as, as to how it would go down? I get some help. I mean, I, I talked and thought that around. And it's funny because it continues a bit of a motif that I've been playing with in the series a lot. Like I have one scene in Out of the Dark where Evan is approached by three cops who he doesn't want to hurt or injure that badly. Right. But they come up on him in a crowded cafe and he sort of describes to them if they don't back off the exact progression of the fight that will ensue <laughs> yeah. and then ask if they'll back off and they refuse to. And so he says, okay, are we going to do this then? And I just end the chapter and I never yeah. show that fight sequence. <laughs> yeah. But three or four chapters later, these cops show up in the next scene and they have all the matching bruises to exactly the scenario that he had described. Yeah, yeah. So I've been right. having a lot of fun lately thinking about like, what are ways that I can have action scenes that are really, really different from other kinds of action scenes that, that I've seen or that we've written before. And that was an example of one of them where I have a full blown action sequence with everything thought out and everything detailed and researched and pinned down. It's a whole world of what could happen. And then maybe it'll happen or maybe it won't. Maybe he's just telling the story. Maybe he's just thinking through because that's how Orphan X's brain works. If you have him detained and he's in a van and he's yeah. thinking about what the different scenarios are, but alas, those scenarios can't always come to fruition. 
I think it has more impact for as a reader. Like I'm reading this and I'm going, holy shit, this <laughs> might actually work. And I'm just, I'm imagining the people he's describing it to who have, they're completely convinced that something like this could never happen in a million years. And just watching the drawdown on their faces. I don't know. For me, it was like, I, I enjoyed reading that as much as if you'd actually had that actually happen. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Mike, 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 I have friends on cat. And, uh, oh, yeah. And so I envision my buddies like in that scenario. And right. I'm just like, I would be chin bricks. I, <laughs> like, are you kidding me? I know I would. <laughs> it was it was pretty cool but i like how you 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 referenced um uh you describe everything that was going to happen you know like that's the motif like and then you know then you end the chapter and in the very beginning of the book th not the scene that we're talking about here but in the beginning yeah where he, uh, evan you know goes to get some really uh interesting vodka yeah. like you do that it's great i love that i love that i'm gonna, <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna steal that for one of my one of my stories <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, it's fun being this far in and having a readership that is really familiar with him, that I can start to play with the motifs, I can start to play with the archetype and take it apart and make fun of it and make it in doing so make it more real, right, and invite kind of right. readers in because y'all are in on y'all are in on this story, right? right. Y'all been there for this journey, right? Um, and I never want to have it be where he's does everything right. And he's kind of up on a pedestal and always has to perform brilliantly, you know, which is why he's got a lot of people who, who talk a lot of shit to him. And whether it's Joey, whether it's yeah, Joey, I mean, Joey's like, she gives him no, no quarter. Yeah. Well, John had a little uh, glitch in this commu communication yeah. here. Here we and go. We have, we have, I think we, we have, have Sean times two now. <laughs> we have two Sean's. We have two Sean's on the screen. It's incredibly dangerous. <laughs> the matrix <laughs> Am I back? one sean cameron yeah. is, is as many as i can handle yeah <laughs> that's a lot of man right there it is. <laughs> it's a lot of sean hold on i'm thinking of uh, that. i better that's go drink lot. some gatorade <laughs> <laughs> okay a am i back you're back okay All right. let me get rid of the other sean though no i'm leaving him up <laughs> yeah. Well, the details of that scene that Mike mentioned and, and really of all the action sequences in the orphan books are always a highlight and frankly humbling to us to read because we're all trying to get to that level. Yeah. But what's your process for writing those scenes? Do you, do you sketch them out at all? Do you physically get up and act any of the movements out or is it all just visualization for you? Hmm. I tend to have ideas around them that are leading up to it. Like I know, you know, I'm, I'm in, I have a manuscript I'm working on right now. I know there's a big scene coming that's going to be a big action-y scene. And I get little pieces, a line of dialogue, um, you know, a clip, a, a, a little piece, tiny piece of badassery, right? Like something that's going to be different with the fight. Right. And I just kind of collect them, right? There's just bullet points. They're sitting there. I'm going to get there in a couple of weeks. You know, I'm not there yet. But then to give you an example, I was thinking about it and I was like, oh, I like to have each action scene in some ways be its own three act play, mm -hmm. right? I like it to have its own internal logic or something that's happening with it. Um, one example I'll give is there is there's a scene in the Nowhere Man, the second book where Evan is being you know held captive in this chateau and he gets downstairs and there's like a whole spa area and he's fighting all these different guys and he's got a non-lethal um, uh, beanbag shooting rifle that he's or shotgun he's taken from one of the guys and he's knocked one guy in the pool and the guy in the pool is trying to reach his gun on the other side and he's fighting this guy who keeps kicking his ass because the guy's a better mixed martial arts fighter than evan but he keeps <laughs> picking up the gun and the guy in the pool keeps get, almost getting the gun and evan like can just get off one shot to <laughs> knock him back into the water to then get his ass kicked again to try and find it and knock the guy again so it's like i like when there's um there's more that's happening rather than just fight or action where there's um, subplots, there's sub agendas, there's ways that I'm framing or embracing it with almost a frame narrative. Interesting. And so for instance, I just figured that out with that scene I was telling you about that I'm writing in two weeks. I think like last night, you know, I was, I was in my, um, my hot yoga class, very Californian <laughs> of me, 110 <laughs> degrees and dying. And I just had this moment of like, oh, that's the frame for that whole action scene. I have all these pieces, oh. but here's how I want to connect. Here's how I want the scene to also tell a story. And, and it's going to mount and it's going to build. 
So does does Greg Hurwitz trust himself to remember that in the middle of a hot yoga session, or does he have to run out of the studio and <laughs> write it down? It's hard, man. I'm sure you guys have this too. It's like when you're in the shower and then you yeah, start shower. stacking them to remember yeah. them where you're uh-huh. like, this line of dialogue, here's that word I was looking for, for the fourth chapter. Here's the new scene. And here's what that conflict's about. Um, so it's tough, but you know, as, um, I think it was Lawrence Kasdan who said being a writer is having homework every day for the rest of your life. (laughs) We're never off. We're never off. The worst is waking up in the middle of the night and think, and something pops out of your head. And then you, you, you promise yourself that you're going to remember it when you wake up. Because you're too tired to write it down. I have all the note pads and there's a couple of times where I'm like, oh, I'm so, it feels like so much work. But then there's other times that I'm up every five minutes and scribbling like a crazy person. So. Yeah. Well, my, my wife has seen me uh, run from the shower. My, she's like, what are you doing? <laughs> like, got a thought. She was like, was that because of a book or just it's random just, naked shower it's, running? It's no, disturbing. no, random shower. No, no, man. That's, okay. you know, it's my normal <laughs> thing. Good. I thought it was just a bit of a, a non sequitur. My wife's seen me run out of the shower a lot. It just happens. No, you're right. You're right. That's exactly <laughs> when, you're, when your shower bourbon gets low. <laughs> and she's scarred. It never gets low, Greg. Never. <laughs> uh, all right. So let's go back to the craft a little bit. How, how do you balance intense action scenes with like emotional depth and, and, and character development in the Orphan X series? It, it is either more important than the other when writing thrillers? Character is always the most important thing. And so for me, every action sequence that I write, I try to think about why it is distinctly an Orphan X action scene and not a Jack Reacher scene, not a Swagger scene, not a James Bond scene, not a mm. Bourne scene. Yeah. It should always be exemplifying some aspect of character, whether it's the way he's fighting, what he's confronting with, what's happening, what that frame is around it that exists, you know, what he has to do to make it work and function. Um, And so character should be inherent in everything. It's like every line of dialogue, right? I always think about if someone's confronted with a situation and what they say or how they react is how you or I would, or most people would, it's not a good scene. Because the character should react in a way that is always idiosyncratic to them, you know. And one of the things about Evan is he's quite ordinary. I I go to a lot of lengths to say, you know, average size, average build, just an ordinary guy, not too handsome. I say that in every book. However, he's an extraordinary character in that his engagement with things has to always be something that is out of the ordinary. So if it's an action sequence that goes like anyone's, you know, if it's a if if it's how court gentry would handle it, then I'm not doing my job, right? Because that's Mark Greeny's job. Yeah. And so I think about that a lot. And I love more and more writing the I just love writing the character stuff and doing the, the like the scenes that are that are um quieter in some regards where the stakes are sort of coming home to roost um i love that and so i've been gravitating a lot more to making sure that i really have time for those scenes to breathe and to also feel like significant and organic parts of the story not just like well then he's home he's going to clear his throat he's going to meditate he's going to work out he's going to like where it's trying to have every single scene have something that is either propulsive for driving the plot and the narration forward or something that feels um, illuminating about character and about sentiment yeah. in a way that readers are going to feel and be able like, to contend with. Like mm-hmm. the disco ball or the, <laughs> the, the Velcro wall. <laughs> That's it. I, I got to tell you, I love your action scenes. You're like one of the best action scene writers I've ever read. Um, Thank you. But your but your your stories are so character driven and and I really love the interactions between Joey and Evan when when they're on the phone when they're in person like I just like I love those those scenes and I love those dialogues and thank you um, thank you I'm so glad okay. I didn't kill her at the end of Hellbent like I was supposed to oh, God. <laughs> oh man yeah. you still be getting nasty email from that uh, so we know you've worked on some things other than just, you know, uh, this series here uh, and you worked on another other projects in the past outside the thriller novel world. Have you ever had any offers to do something that you passed on that you could actually share with us? Oh yeah. I mean, uh, a decent amount. 
of things have come up. I mean, there's a stage in, in one's career where, where things are coming in that, that either I don't, I haven't had the bandwidth or the interest in. So a lot of that's, I've had offers to write, um, you know, if there's, let's say there's a deceased author who's a household name and they want somebody to write the next book for them or finish yeah. a partially completed manuscript. Um, I've had a lot of it in comics um, because if you write in comics, you just get a lot of offers if you've had some measure of success. Yeah. Um, I'd written in comics for 10 years before AWA. And we were talking a little bit about my graphic anthology series called New Think that just came out. But I got offered a lot of different characters from Marvel and DC and even some um, of really? the bigger independence that I didn't have the interest or, or the bandwidth. Um, but I got to write the ones that I loved. Um, yeah, like like Batman? <laughs> like Batman? <laughs> like Punisher? I, dude, I, first of all, I'm a huge Greg Hurwitz fan, just so you know. So I like I have all your comic books. Like I oh, love everything you. that you write, brother. I read and and if it's Batman, it, if if this camera and probably would would pan over to my left, uh, you would see all my Batman collectibles. Yeah, kind of got it all, right. dude. Yeah. It's um, so yeah. that like you writing that stuff is like blows my mind. Like whole like I wonder what Marvel character do you are you like nah not interested? Is it like Moon Knight? Is it like I don't know? Well, I wrote Moon Knight. I know. Um, it's <laughs> yeah. No, I. I think it's more like, you know, when I was on Batman, you know, they were saying, do you want to come back and do some of the X-Men? Do you want to do this? Do you want to do that? And I was like, look, I wrote my favorites. I wrote, I got to write Punisher, Batman, Wolverine, Moon Knight. Um, I actually wrote an arc of the Hulk that I still hope we had an amazing artist who got pulled in another project. So that's, I still hope one day that that'll come out. I swung Spider-Man through one uh, episode of Moon Knight, which was really fun. And it's just, you know, I didn't, there's been stuff that's been offered and it happens sometimes in film and TV too. It's such a commitment, right? That, you know, they're, they're shopping for, you know, a rewrite. They want someone to adapt a book or there's a short story and it just doesn't, I mean, I only want to do stuff that I love. And fortunately yeah. there's enough stuff for me to have way more than I can kind of manage or, or, yeah. or I shouldn't say more than I can manage, but I have, I have a lot. I have there's a lot of things that I can do that I love and that I'm really seeing and feeling. And it's nice to be able to get a little bit more, um, to just choose even more so. I mean, when I was young, I think what's interesting is I never took a job that was just a job. I was really careful um, to not want to dissipate huh. by relationship, by having it be like, oh, I don't really want to do this, but I'll write this adaptation for a movie for a payday or yeah. I'll take another comic book. I don't really give a shit about just to earn money. Right. Cause I think that, you know, you're, as with anything, you have to maintain your relationships with yeah. a kind of level of purity. And that's true with your relationship with writing, you know? And so I never did that, but I think when I was younger, I was also like so enthusiastic about yeah. like, I can it was, make it happen. Yeah. I, I want to do that. Sure. I'll figure that out. Sure. I'll figure out Moon Knight. Like I, when I got offered Moon Knight, I didn't really, Moon Knight was not one of the characters I grew up with of all the ones that I wrote, but I literally went and got every single Moon Knight issue that had been written basically as Doug wow. Munch. And I just went back and read all of it. And like, I was so excited, you know, and then yeah. I worked on my arc, which was really cool. Um, <laughs> but like today, I wouldn't necessarily, if someone's like, here's this character you didn't really grow up with and don't really get, I don't know that I would have the same like sort of joint enthusiasm to take to it. Right. But other things catch me. Like I'll, I, I'll read, I'm doing a rewrite right now for um, a James Wan horror script um, for Screen Gems. I sold a movie there with my writing partner from Sweet Girl, Philip Eisner. And there was this really cool horror project that they like a great script um, that was just two, two younger writers, um, really good premise. And they wanted to kind of build on it and have it go in different directions. And I just, you know, we, I read it, it was like, I know exactly how we should dig into this thing. That's awesome. And so, you know, you find stuff also in surprising ways where something comes in and all of a sudden you're like, Oh, I know how to tell that story. And I can't wait right. to get. Hmm. And Mike, let me, can I ask a question real quick? Is yeah, please do. Topic? Yeah. So, um, so I, as I said before, like I, Greg, I, I read your comics, I read your stories. Like I just love all that stuff. What's the time commitment on on like a graphic novel, like The Dark Knight? Like how much time does do you? I know you're not doing the illustrations, 
but how much time do you spend you know on on something like this i know there's multiple there's multiple uh issues but like just one of these if i'm so it's always hard to say right because there's so many different parts yeah but if I'm really clear on a comic and have nobody interrupting me, it is possible for me to write a script for a comic in a day. That's super focused and that's sitting down for like 10 to 12 straight hours when I already know what the story is. Okay. Um, often two days is, is about the length. I write, I tend to write pretty fast. I do a lot of work in my head when I'm working on other stuff. So when I sit yeah. down to write something, often it's right there for me. Yeah. Um, but then of course... The art comes in page by page and I, I oversee that, right? I make sure that the sketches are lining up. And then there's another, um, Sean keeps popping in and Sean, out on it. Sean a, keeps, hey guys. <laughs> <laughs> hey guys, what are you doing now? <laughs> Sean, so we're it, talking comics. What are you yeah. doing? It actually made me update it. So I had oh. to update it and then sit there while I did that. All right. Um, Sorry. So it just, it, you know, then, then there's a long process where the pages come in, like for new think, um, my new comic um, anthology, then, then you want to do the dialogue. Then you look at when they lay in the lettering, right. To make sure that the, that it matches up with the art. So there's a lot of kind of follow-up work with it on the straight creative though. Um, you know, I tended to write an arc. If I had a six issue arc, let's say of a comic, let's say it's, it's on Batman. I would tend to sit down and like hammer it out in a week or two, like the rough parameters of it. Right. Whereas a lot of people kind of write one or two comics a month and they just spread it out through the month. Right. And that's their schedule. But for me, I'm, I'm doing it often on hiatus to get back to the novels or scripts or other stuff. And the novels mm -hmm. have always been the backbone of my career. I mean, that's always the, but, my kind of I, first love and the spine of my career. I would say it, it probably gives you a good break though, where you, uh, you like re energizes you, I guess, to go back into the novel when you're doing like the comic stuff and whatnot. Because gives That's you right. a break. Yeah, it's like a multi-sport athlete. You take that right. season off and go on to the next season. It kind of refreshes you for the for the next one around. Yeah, and it's like it's like they're different muscles, and so it yeah. helps if you're in writing shape. But you know, it's it's a bit like different events in a decathlon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Writing shape. Like well, there's a line in the in the book: "Don't surround yourself with like-minded people. You'll get limited or radicalized." Um, and that's from Jack. And it, that line really hit home with me because it kind of speaks to the echo chambers we find ourselves in, um, patting ourselves on the back uh, for our brilliance and denigrating any viewpoint that isn't our own. And I've, I've told you this before that one of my favorite things and maybe my favorite thing about this series is that you weave bigger themes into a dynamic story without ever beating us over the head with it. But was that was that line and that sort of theme kind of was that sort of driving part of this from the from the back back row driving what from the back row what are you the, 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 the storyline because i mean like the, the, there's i mean not the storyline it was that something that you really wanted to bring out um beyond just that line because it seems to me like and, and we'll talk about this later but your other comic book series is kind of in the same vein as that is we're mm. We've kind of pushed. I've been our thinking so much about how part of the problem I think we get into with politics, culture, polarization, is that we're like screaming from these these moral positions, right, all the time. It's instant kind of like moral outrage, or okay. you know, if you think that you're no longer acceptable. And one of the things for me that that I love writing about Evan so much is like he doesn't give a shit about that. It's tactics and it's strategy. And you know what? If you pay close enough attention to strategy and you really think it through all the way, it tends to align morally. Yeah. And so the thing with, J with, with, with Jack giving him this advice, he's not giving him this advice so that Evan can go off and be like a huge TikTok influencer, right? Or run for public <laughs> office. Jesus. He's saying, if you want to keep your mind aware, right? If you want to keep on alert, if you want to be able to assimilate and accommodate information, right? And and have a mind that is active and disciplined, you better not close it off because that will affect you operationally. It'll affect how you move in the world. It'll affect how you can assess threats. It'll affect how you can respond to danger. It affects everything. And so one of the things that I really enjoy in writing Evan is I can write about stuff um, for how he's contending with stuff that revolves around killing people 
or missions or sniper rounds or hand-to-hand -hand combat or psychological warfare. Um, but a lot of the ways that he contends with things are also things that we can use. It's the same thing that of, of ways that we can be engaging in our normal lives. It's like, you know, if you, if you only are around people who think like you, that's what happens, right? You get radicalized, you get, you, your mind no longer becomes your own. It gets warped by psyops, whether that's just like algorithms online designed by a, teams of addiction specialists, yeah. you know, exactly how to punch you to keep I mean, you on a rabbit hole search on social media or YouTube, yeah. right? Or you're just in a sort of group of like-minded people and then you don't even know how to contend with people who aren't from what you consider your tribe, who have different viewpoints, who are disruptive, who are innovative, who are moving things around. And so you ossify. And that's a dangerous position to be in. And I'm never preaching it from a political perspective. I'm never preaching it from even really much, very often a moral perspective, though Evan has his own code. But the lessons that he learns of how he deals, even how he deals with pain inside his own body, right? If he has something is knotted and how he's trying to stretch out or figure yeah, out, yeah, yeah. right? Like what the techniques are for loosening around a trauma in his body, in literally like scar tissue and in uh, muscles that are seizing up, isn't dissimilar to what he has to do around aspects of trauma or emotional sticking points he finds within himself. It's all the yeah. same thing. And so he just views it as a constant process of kind of, um, you know, Clear, clear of body, clear of mind, right? Clear of right. all those things. And I've said before that he's sort of, um, he's a he's a blue collar Renaissance man. That's what Jack calls him, <laughs> you know? And he reminds me a lot. And I mentioned this in a manuscript I'm working on a little bit later, the, the precursor to the CIA, um, I forget the name of it, but there was a group, an intelligence group that was the precursor. OSS. Yeah, thank you. I figured one of you boys would know that. <laughs> and what they said was they were looking for PhDs who could win a bar fight. Right. And that to me is Evan. It's like, he has all this stuff, right? But we, if you become the intellect that falls in love with yourself, which Luke Devine runs the risk of being in the book, yeah. bring it back to tell no one. If you think you have all the answers, right? You think you have all the power and then you're alone in a room with Orphan X, you don't have anything. Right. 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 It doesn't matter. And so in a lot of ways, the clarity that he brings and the discipline that he brings to his training and to his body, that second commandment, how you do anything is how you do everything, right? That's been a very, that's been a kind of a guiding principle in my, in my own life. Um, not that I can achieve it <laughs> nearly to the extent that I want to, or as well as he does. But if you, if you may, if everything matters, then all of a sudden everything starts to matter in the other way. Right. And so- it's a lot of what it's about. And Jack's telling him, don't tuck into an in-group. Like, you're never going to fit in. That's one of the motifs. You're right. always going to be lonely. You're never going to fit in. It's never, never going to happen. No more, man. Yeah. Um, Greg, I got to tell you, the, the second commandment has become a commandment in my family. So I have a 13-year-old son. Yep. And I can't tell you how many times I have mentioned that to him. How you do anything is how you do everything. I just did that this weekend with my I oldest. I use it all the time. So like- Oh, really? Amazing. Like the things that you, like you brought up in your head, like, and you write down your stories, like that has become part of the, the mantra of my family. Oh, I and love how that. We talk about sports, how we talk about school. And we talk about even just like the little things, like my son sweeping up the cat litter from the litter box. I'm like, no, pay attention to what you're doing because how you do anything is how you do everything. Right. And well, so it's like- Plus one of Chris's kids did something and they wouldn't admit which one. He said, listen, never let an innocent die. So <laughs> <try to live. laughs> very, very, very important. Very important. Fair. Uh, so, you can see too, like that commandment also plays into Evan's OCD, right? Oh, his yeah. right. Because you can get stuck on that one. Right. You can, you can uh, rigidify off that one too. So it's like, it's, it's a, it's a tricky balance, but I, I find, yeah, I mean, so that's really a big part of it. I love those scenes. I love writing the scenes where he goes back with Jack, these sort of seminal teaching moments that built him up to who he was um, because it's, it's such a key part of how he moves in the world. Yeah, they're, they're actually one of my other favorite line was, or and I, I'm not even going to try to quote it, but it was when Jack was talking to him about if you don't value you, if you have no value, then no one has value. And um, you know, that, I, I I read that. Those are the lines that and I love this about 
when, when I read a book like yours and there's a handful of other thriller writers that make me do this, I'll read it and I'll sit there and I'll, and I meditated over what that whole passage was before I moved on because there, there really are. I mean, again, you don't beat people over the head with it. It's all part of the story. It all it's very entertaining, but I, I learn reading your books about human nature more than the average thriller. So. Hmm. Thank you. I also learned that uh, certain muscles on, on how to like, if you're in a car accident, get rear-ended, how to fix that when Evan was having that conversation with Joey on the phone and she's like, yeah, of course I know how to fix yeah. my, I don't even know the, the name of the muscle. Yeah, I was taking notes for my next patient. Yeah. I'm not an amateur. <laughs> right. She's anyway. such a pain in, she's, she's such a pain in, in my and Evan's ass. That one. Yeah. <laughs> but she's so, she's unique and I just love her as a character. But anyway, so, so writing, writers draw inspiration from many different places. You got a uh, personal experience, movies, books, historical events, historical people, um, and I think you kind of alluded it, to it before, but where or from whom did you draw inspiration when creating Luke, uh, Luke Devine? <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> um, Luke represents, um, hmm. I think there's more of me in Luke Devine than I'd want to admit. Um, probably there, there's, he's, he's, you know, a, a all our characters in some regard are a reflection of us some more than others. And so there's aspects of that for sure that are um, things that I've grappled with um, and trying to think about if I were to project these and make them immensely larger than life, like what kind of shapes could they take on and how far down do some of them go? Um, so that's one part of it. And I think he also represents in a lot of ways um some of the world I came from, you know, I went to, I went to fancy schools and was surrounded with a lot of people who were really, really bright. Um, um, some of whom were really wise too, but being really smart doesn't mean you're really wise, right? Those are two different things. Oh, seen uh, it. and it's pretty funny that, that a lot of the wisdom in the book comes from like Jack or from Tommy, right? Like, mm -hmm. um, I didn't quite realize I do this, but a lot of times if something's a more cerebral notion, I'll like give it to Tommy in his language, right? Like Tommy will say, Tommy's like the, you know, he's like the bar regular philosopher, you know, he's <laughs> just, but so I think Luke in a lot of ways represents that part of the sort of intellectual power acquisition um, play where it you where you start to believe that's all that all that that is where you exist in a realm of your own making in a certain way and can get lost in your own um thoughts um and in luke divine's case in his own presumed brilliance yeah and you become a a god within your own echo chamber yep. yeah. until someone reminds you you're not <laughs> usually my mom Pals. well hey guess what <laughs> happened he what? made it out of the, he made it out of the regular portion of the show. Yeah. Somehow, some way, he always figures it out. Wow. Even with technical difficulties, <laughs> we we got around it, Sean. We got raise a glass to that. All right, here the we go. Lives of Sean Cameron, we got through. Mm. This is this is the favorite round of all child psychologists worldwide, and that is called the lightning round, where we ask some questions and we get really all right. And yeah, we're gonna let you go first since you are the youngest. I am the youngest. Yeah, I hate you. Go. Uh, all right. So uh, mine have a theme to it, apparently. Um, comic books, comic hmm. book type stuff. So question one, from the outside looking in, it appears the DC extended universe is in shambles. Man of Steel 2 is dead. Black Adam quit. The Flash is literally on the run. What would you do to write the ship of that franchise? Mm, I'd do part of what I did for the new 52 reboot, which is I would come in really hard on the villains. Cause I think we're, we're spending a lot of time with iterations of this, this, the superheroes who we all know and love. Yeah. And particularly with Batman's rogues gallery, every one of them represents a different facet of Batman. Everyone is a yin to that yang or the yeah. yang is yin, depending on which way you look at it. And I think that if you can build out a, a, a that rogues gallery of really robust three-dimensional characters from that side, it just breathes new life into everything. I like it. 
you should definitely do that. Batman's one of my favorite characters anyway, so anything to do with it, him is awesome. All right, so uh, last year, the AWA published uh, your comic book, a uh, series of them, uh, Knighted, which if you guys haven't gotten, you should get and should read it. It's fantastic. Um, so first, could you tell our audience what AWA is and why it's important? And B, um, what else you have coming? I mean, you talked about it a little bit before, but what else you got coming out right now? So AWA is Artists, Writers, and Artisans. It's a new comic book company, which um, I helped start, um, you know, peripherally. Um, but I was, I, was, I was there from kind of day one. I've been on the creative council. And we went with the editor-in-chief, the former editor-in-chief of Marvel, Axel Alonso, went off to start one. And basically the aim was we wanted to build another comic company to kind of compete with Marvel and DC at that scale with that, with that level of talent and artists. It's an amazing creative council. It's Joseph Michael Straczynski, uh, Lita Calagridis, um, Al Madrigal, um, Joe Straczynski, who just directed Top Gun. Um, I'm forgetting people, but um, it's, it's just, it's an amazing crew. Um, so that's been super exciting. Oh, Reggie Hudlin, who's amazing, started BET, directed, you know, Boomerang. Um, I'm just looking, there's a cartoon sketch of us that they did. I was just glancing at the wall. So basically <laughs> what we wanted is something that that is really um, driven by creators and where the creative aspect, and there's different kinds of creative freedom than you can get with bigger corporations and it kind of breathe new life into and through these forms. And we built out a shared universe Knighted is part of that. And then I wrote New Think, um, which is a anthology, graphic novel anthology. We have five different tales by five different artists. And they're all about um, polarization, uh, menace, tribalism, extremism, and tech addiction, and the currents that give rise to them. And it's told in the form of five hard genre tales. One is like a science fiction story. Um, one is a old fashioned scary fairy tale. One is a horror stalker story. One is a time travel story, a variation on that. And the last one is a is a pretty chilling children's story. And so each one is a different format with different art. and there there are these hard genre takes on the insanity of this cultural moment. Um, I think of it a little bit like Black Mirror meets the Twilight Zone. Hmm. Oh, I like that. Um, if, if people are curious about it, uh, awastudios.net is where you want to go. Uh, take a look at it. They got some, the, first of all, you, the artwork is comparable, if not better than DC or Marvel. Um, they do some really, really amazing stuff. Uh, so check that out. Um, so here's That's my a lot of, question. And a lot of us came in from Marvel and DC. I mean, so it's really world-class talent. It, it really is. I mean, it's, it's phenomenal. Um, Oh, let me ask you. So, uh, Knighted, are we going to see uh, some more Knighted? We're going to see some more Bob? We're thinking about that. You know, I, I kind of went off. I had the, the bandwidth to hit new thing, but we're having that conversation. So I'll keep you posted. I want to see it. So. <laughs> Chris right. says, make it happen. You'll, you'll have one sale. I mean, I'll, I'll <laughs> okay. All right. So here's my last question. Uh, I don't know if Evan Smoke would enjoy watching a superhero movie. I would think he might because you're, you know, you created him. But if he did, which would be his favorite? And you can't say Batman. Uh, X-Men First Class. What would be the character he would gravitate towards? Oh boy, Xavier. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. It's so good. It's so like seminal and grounded in history and I think he'd get a kick out of it from all those hours he spent in Jack's study with the oh, right. walls reading leather bound tomes. Right. Okay. Dusty old books. All right. Well, Sean decided to leave us again. So I'm going to go next here. Uh, number one, if Evan wasn't an assassin, what would be the worst career job title ever for him? Um, director, human resources. <laughs> family counselor <laughs> starting salary six figures though yeah <laughs> doesn't you wouldn't care yeah. him and human resources i guess hoa president 
<laughs> would, would he be like a Nazi if he was an HOA president? I, I think he would. Yeah, it'd be bad. No, I don't. I think he would just be murderous. In, <laughs> in, murderous. He wouldn't be like you're talking about the like the discipline side of of Nazism of keeping everybody in line. I yeah. think he'd be much more like violently out out outbursts. <laughs> Better keep those hedges trimmed, baby. <laughs> That's right. No blue. No blue doors. Um. Uh, okay. Number two, uh, what Hollywood actor or actress in real life appears to be the most similar to Evan's personality? In real life, you mean people I have a like, like a real life, yeah, like a real life actor actress who seems to be more like Evan in Evan's character in in, in the in the real life in their real life. Hmm. I'm going to say something that's surprising because it's not a fit for him for casting in the least but i think keanu reeves he stays very far back from the yeah yeah he quietly does what he does he's very i I worked on a project with him for a while on a tv show he's very bright and he's very about what it is that he's doing he's a perfectionist for his craft uh, he's renowned to be a really sort of good human karmically. I mean, the stories abound about his uh, goodwill and generosity, and he stays way back away from the limelight. Um, he really does. And, and, and yeah. tries to be very, very quiet and govern himself by his own set of rules. And so as much as he's not who I think of in terms of casting, I think right. the way that he comports himself is similar. Well, I know he's like... It- even his training for John Wick role, like yeah. he, the guy's obsessive, like beyond uh, to get it right. So I could kind of see that. Yeah. He's, a, he's OCD too, right? So He has to be. I don't know. I can't speak to the OCD part, but I would think he he's, would um, he's quite a talent and he's got a lot of, uh, a lot of insight. Yeah. And it's very Zen like. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Hmm. All right. Okay. Well, my last question is going to be, what is your, since you've, you've given us information about this in the past, what is your most recent vodka recommendation that you've discovered? Hmm. What is that called? Um, Well, the gold standard for me always is Kaufman vintage. Um, I think it's the best vodka in the world. It's Russian. It's impossible to get now. I mean, it's thousands of dollars a bottle. At K-A-U-F-F, this point. Kaufman? Yeah, yeah no, Kaufman. I'm I'm sure. Early Orphan X um, one. There's an amazing new um, British vodka, and I'm blanking on the name of it now. Um, that's, that's why we have the internet. Chris will find it. You watch. I know. <laughs> I got to figure it. Um, we'll put the investigator on it. <laughs> It's um, it looks a lot like kettle one, the bottle, but it's not kettle one. Um, okay, I got to figure this out. It's going to be in a book. Can you can you find it in a regular shop, or do you have to go to some specialty boutique? It's no. specialty. Is it, is it Beluga? No, that's no. Russian. I like the Beluga Black a lot. Beluga, that's what I'm looking at. Actually, I'm doing a search. So if this gets too annoying, oh, here it is. It's Chase. And now I'm going to have to Chase. Look. Chase vodka, everybody. Chase vodka. It's wonderful. Oh yes, yes. It looks like a Chopin bottle, actually. It looks like Chopin and Kettle One, almost exactly. Such that I I'd ordered it and it came in, and I was like, "Who sent me a bottle of of Chopin?" If you put the bottles, so it's <laughs> yeah, it's very similar to those, but it's an it's a really nice vodka. And is it available in the states, or do you have to? Yeah, it's a bit it's a bit challenging to find, but yeah. Um, you'll be able to find it. I had to order it. Okay. Mike, this is prim- primarily why uh, I like to do this. these interviews is to get... I, I'm all about the, the liquor. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm all about the liquor recommendations. Definitely. definitely. Chase, okay. Um, I guess John's decided he's had it with us. He ran out of lives. <laughs> he gets he gets hangry, so I think he had to stop by and get a sandwich before he got back on here. Can, 
That sounds very on brand. Yeah, he's uh, he's been very he's been very vocal on on our messaging to about <laughs> yeah. how frustrated he is right now, and we and Chris and I know how frustrating technology is. For oh him, my god, so. right. it's <laughs> the worst. He goes, he goes. I really wanted to ask my lightning round question, so should we ask his lightning round questions? Yeah, how do so. the moment? All I right. think so. No, All go right, ahead. you ask you ask the first one. All right, I'll go for the first one. Um, Okay, so Sean says, while recording a previous episode, I recommended to try Reka vodka, dot, dot, dot. Had you tried Reka? Mm. Yeah, might even make an appearance. <gasps> Ooh, he's going to get liquor credit in the next book. All right, here we go. All right. Um, okay. Is there any truth, this is Sean's question, is there any truth to the rumor Orphan X was based on the ultra cerebral Vin Diesel Thriller, <laughs> Triple X. <laughs> no. Sean, you hear that? He's we all up. knew. We all we all knew that answer. Yeah, that's not that's not a revelation for any of us. <laughs> so you get the last question, Mike. Oh yeah, okay, I get. Oh, wait, oh great. Um, oh geez, how do I it's ask funny. this without like losing my license? It's all right. Funny. Did a child inspire the butt the butt clapper, or is that something Greg Hurwitz has often thought about? <laughs> <laughs> if, your, if your butt was horizontal, I would like to ask vertical. the Colorado Medical Board that this was not my own words and my own <laughs> thoughts. And I do not <laughs> endorse. I don't even remember now. It's so inane. It's just so perfect. Like it's the perfect Peter eight-year-old boy question. It, or 45 year old person. or where we're at yeah man. that's yeah. true that's true really gentlemen this is how we're ending this this literary conversation. It's a, it, it ends on the butt mm. clapper but more importantly it ends on another uh, fine drink and another amazing book right here oh john's back and we already asked this is, question is he so. back is he back is he back for the i don't know <gasps> he's coming in Sean, <laughs> how are you? Raise the glass, Sean. We're saying goodbye. Ra raise your glass. I have I have one lightning round question for you. Just okay. one. We already okay. asked them. You may not remember this, but um, while recording a previous episode, I mentioned Reka vodka to you, and you actually took notes and wrote it down. Well, Reka obviously is probably the key point of this entire book. It probably everything rises off of the Reka vodka. So. A lot of people would ask for a co-authorship. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to ask for you to name a character after me. All I ask is that maybe you consider in the future the middle name of a Rhodesian Ridgeback. You name either Sean or Cameron. Just the middle name. The middle name. <laughs> he he middle. asked that a lot better than you guys did. I did. He did. Actually. Yeah. Hmm. Um, I didn't want to give him all that. It'll credit. be considered. And thank you for the recommendation, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's the best value out there, vodka-wise. So. We did ask your other questions, but I was way. very happy. I was very happy to read. Uh, yes. Now I'm under investigation for your third question. Great. Uh, yeah. Hey, <laughs> the last orphan. Every every time this year, I'm like, Greg's coming out with a new book, please. And here it is. I got to tell you, man, I, I love you, Greg. I, lo I love your stories. I love your writing, but I also hate you, bro. Because <laughs> I'm an aspiring writer, too. And I'm just like. Thanks for the thanks for the yeah. bar. Keep, All right, Sean's out, out and Keep Chris out and I will wrap it up. Have Sean's a good already one, gone again. Sean, Gentlemen, Sean's it's always a pleasure. Thank you. Every time. See ya. Okay, bye. All right. And that was Greg Hurwitz, the amazing talent and the last orphan, his latest Orphan X book. And Sean has rejoined the program uh, once again uh, during this episode. And uh, Sean, any last thoughts about Orphan X? No, I just want to say it was a good, it's a great book. I uh, love reading it, but I really, really love uh, you, Mike, and and Chris, and I think you guys are so much better writers than me. Yeah, well, you know, we appreciate you uh, recognizing the the truth and all of that. Uh, we appreciate your truth uh, as the third member of the program, and uh, to me and Chris, hey, we love this book, and you will too. Adios, muchachos. See you soon. Cheers. Cheers.